yep, I'm going to start the PowerPoint. We are, I'm also, while I'm te teaching for the first time, testing new technology. So, and now we're going to go to the mode where I can time myself so I don't keep you guys past the time limit. So, here we are. And I'm going to actually use a pen with our new Surface device as well. Okay. So the Lord put on my heart actually to teach a condensed version, or I'm going to call it a trailer version, a trailer version of what Pastor Roxer taught in 2013 on the will of God. And it's been really useful to me to go back to the series a number of times, and it's really been helpful for me the past couple months of I've been dabbling in it, just how it's been used in my life. So I would encourage you to go to our website and listen to 11-part series. And I did bring one piece of paper tonight. I brought the handout. Otherwise, I'm paperless. So if you look at your handout, I'm actually going to show you how to navigate to our website. If you look at your handout, if you go to our website and go to sermons, so put sermons in the first blank there. And after that, you go to sermon search, sermon search. And if when the search command comes up, if you search the will of God, you're going to find an 11-part series that is going to be much more thorough than what I'm going to do tonight. But I would encourage you to go take a chance and go listen to the, that by going sermon, sermon, search, and search will of God. The title of my message tonight is How to Know the Will of God. And as Pastor Rocks are taught in that 2013 series, when making the decision, always start with the known will of God. There are many worldly resources or guides to teach us or tell us how we should live our lives. And tonight's message is going to go look at the Bible, though. And I'm going to summarize Christian living in a simple formula, actually, even though I know the Bible doesn't have formulas. This is kind of tongue-in-cheek. But I put it in a formula to kind of contrast with all the self-help, couchy stuff that the world has for formulas for success. And I'm actually an engineer by trade, so I like math. So we're going to do a little math tonight as well. We do live in a self-help world that teaches we can have it all, literally. There's books out there. We can have it all, right there. Have it all, part one. And Methodist preacher turned reform church preacher Norman Vincent Peale has a book that reportedly sold 5 million copies, The Power of Positive Thinking. And we in the world often turn to human viewpoint for joy. There's actually the book of joy here by Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And this is the one that really kind of stunned me. This is a self-help book, and here's what it says. This self-help book teaches you what you can learn from the 10 best self-help books of our time. <laughs> That's right. There's a self-help book to teach us about self-help books. <laughs> so this is the world we live in. We live in a world that values beauty. We know this. It values brains. It values bronze. It values bucks. But human viewpoint is clearly not we are to seek the known will of God. Now, the week I was asked to teach, this was all the way back in, in May. I picked the very last spot to give me as much time as possible to prepare. <laughs> and I didn't want to go on a Sunday, so that's why I'm here. But here's a story. Two stories of our world struck me the week I was asked to teach. And this is May 8, 2017. I'll read the story a little quick. It says, the Catholic institution, Fordham University, rejected a proposal to open Chick-fil-A on campus after students at the New York-based college voiced concerns that the restaurant chain is anti-gay. Controversy has followed Chick-fil-A after its owners expressed a view against same-sex marriage stemming from Christian beliefs. The very same week, May 11th, the same week as the Chick-fil-A story, this story in the bottom right comes up. It's eighth grade parents in New London, Minnesota are battling to remove a book that according to one parent contains gratuitous and unnecessary profanity and references to sexual acts. The parent added, parents have the right to teach their own values to their children regarding these topics and have assurances that a classroom teacher would teach those same values. A school board member though concluded this book is worth defending, and that censorship needs to be opposed. Chick-fil-A was censored and rejected. In New London, the book remains in the school. So take a look at what the Word of God said. I would ask you to turn to Titus 2. We're going to start tonight in Titus 2. Titus 2, 
and we're going to look at verse 11. And I'm going to suggest that Christians should look to the Word of God for their self-help answers. Titus 2 and 11 says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So look at this sentence right here. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. The question is, how do we do that? How do we deny ungodliness and worldly lust? Human viewpoint, ungodliness and worldly lust are all around us. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust is a chapter in J.F. Strombeck's book. He lived from 1881 to 1959, and he wrote the following in Discipline by Grace. The word ungodly is defined as not having regard for God. It includes all that is done without taking God into account. Many speak of the unsaved as ungodly, but fail to realize that everything a saved person does without taking God into account is also ungodly. The saved are godly because of their standing in Christ, but many tolerate ungod much ungodliness in their lives. Every act in a believer's life that does not take God into account is ungodly. Everything that one cannot ask God to bless is ungodly. Now, I think this is rather humbling, and I added this to your handout as a principle to remember the last part of his message here, the last part of his writings here. Every act in a believer's life that does not take God into account is ungodly. So, moving forward, I'm going to give you in your hand out there, and I realize, again, the Bible doesn't have a formula, but I'm going to put it in formula <laughs> format, the, the formula for Christian living. It's one, first part of your formula there, plus U, subscript D, plus S to the 8 power. So if that makes sense, we can just end the message here in seven minutes. But I'm assuming some explanations in, in mind, so let's do this. So one in my formula, is God, this infinite, self-existing, sovereign creator of the universe. And two, we're going to be talking in this message about you walking independent, you walking independent on Jesus Christ day by day. And three, we're going to be taking a look at seeking to do the known will of God described by eight S's. So one again is God. And again, understand, this is a tongue-in-cheek with the formula, but hopefully it will help us remember some of these principles. We have a part to play, but our Christian lives really begin and end with God. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the infinite self-existing one. And it's difficult for us to really, as human beings, to really even adequately find words to describe and understand him. Then the next graphic I'm going to show you, we've seen many times, tries to reasonably reflect his attributes that our mind can kind of comprehend. And you've all seen this before if you've been here any amount of time. We know that God is sovereign, which means he's providential. He is righteous. He's just. And you combine those two means he's holy. He is love. And he shows mercy, grace, goodness, long-suffering. He's eternal life. He's omniscient. Now it's really getting to terms that are kind of hard for me to grab my four-dimensional mind around when you think of it. Omniscient, he knows everything past, present, and future. He's omnipresent. He's not limited to space. I don't quite grasp that one myself, but he's everywhere present at the same time, yet he's separate from his creation. And he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's able to do everything consistent with his nature. He's also immutable, which means he never changes his character. He never changes his nature. And he's veracity, which means he's truth. And when you combine those two, he's faithful. And I really like Psalm 50, 21. It says, you thought that I was altogether like you. We try to compare, just like I'm comparing me and how I present to somebody else. We try to compare ourselves to God, but we really can't understand exactly and we'll never understand his greatness this side of heaven. And I appreciate the recent series Pastor Roxer taught about be humble or be humbled and talked about the greatness of God. The second part of my formula is you. Again, it's walking dependent on Jesus Christ day by day. And I read a little bit more of that J.F. Strombeck, and he had four paragraphs, but I'm going to condense it into one that I really liked. 
in Discipline by Grace. He said this, the fact that the true life under grace is one of complete dependence upon God is evidence that life must be lived by the power of God. If that life could be lived in the power of a believer, it would become a life dependence upon self and not dependence upon God. And I really like the, the series Pastor Roxer taught earlier this year. June 11th, he taught a portrait of pride for King Saul. He said, due to pride, Saul viewed total obedience to God's will as optional instead of imperative. Pastor Roxer stated he was Saul Sinatra singing, I'll do it my way. Verse 9 says this in that 1 Samuel 15 that we looked at in that message. But Saul and the people spared, and my oral Bible, my Bible, audio Bible today says Agog, so Agog, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Verse 9 shows that God did not follow the instructions, that Saul did not follow the instructions of God. Saul viewed God's will as optional, and he partially obeyed. It had generational impact. You think he lost the whole reign of Israel because of that. So the question we should all be asking ourselves are the questions, is the will of God important to me? Do I know what the will of God is? And where do I find the will of God? One more uh, little phrase that Pastor Roxer added that June 11th message that I found really intriguing was he said this, the walk of a believer is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment issue. And starting well does not guarantee you'll finish the Christian life well. When you shift from a humble attitude to a proud posture, you are headed for personal disaster in your Christian life. So back to that formula. It's God plus you daily depending on him and seeking to do the will of God. So where do we find the will of God? Well, in that 2013 series that Pastor Roxer taught, the first lesson was this, how to know and do the will of God, and he started with a promise, a premise, and a principle to remember. And that's where your handout's going to start in part A here. In the beginning, the promise started with a verse very familiar to us, so let's please turn to uh, Proverbs 3, please. Please turn to Proverbs 3, and we're going to see our beginning promise tonight, where to find the will of God. And we're going to see that it comes in four parts. So Proverbs 3, many of us who've been here any time will know this verse really well. The first part of this verse is, and it's on your hand out there, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is our part. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Again, our part is next. Lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. And again, our part, in all your ways, acknowledge him. So three parts of ours, and then here's the promise. God's promise, he will direct your path. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So that's our promise. Pastor Roxer went on to define a premise, and John 7 outlines the basic premise regarding the will of God. And there's four parts of this premise. And the first part on your handout there, four parts of the premise, God has a will. John 7, 17, you don't need to turn there, I have it up here. It says, if anybody wants to do his will... His will, and we're going to break this down, God has a will for us. If anyone desires to do his will. So God has a plan for us. After salvation, he doesn't immediately just take us home. And I really like, I don't know if you had a chance to watch uh, Pastor Kurt put up a chronological gospel to uh, YouTube recently, and he said this. Human beings are going to achieve more glory and more exaltation by way, and this word's going to be in our message all over and overnight, by dependence on God, then Satan or the angels, the higher created beings, will ever achieve through independence. We're still here for a purpose. God has a plan for each one of us. And to see that in a little more detail, let's go to Matthew 10, please. Let's go to Matthew 10. I 
I believe God's plan is very personal and that God cares about the very details of our life. And if we go to Matthew 10 and see in verse 29 through 31, we're going to read this. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable. You are of more value than many sparrows. The very hairs of our head are numbered. God has a, has a detailed plan for each one of us. And he goes on and talks about that same uh, message in, in Luke 12, 6 through 7 as well. So God has a will, and he, cares, he has a plan for each one of us, and it's very detailed. So he has a will. Number two on your handout there in part B, he wants you to know his will. He wants you to know his will. Looking at John 7, 17 again, if anyone wants to do his will, he shall know, and he shall know is a future indicative of gnosko, gnosko. And what it means is he will come to know. He will come to know. If anybody wants to do his will, he will come to know. To see this a little bit more, we're going to go to Ephesians 5. If you go to Ephesians 5, please. Ephesians 5. As Pastor Roxer stated in that message, he said, I know God wants us to know his will more than we want to do it. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15, says this. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The word fools here. We walk as fools when we walk out of fellowship with God. We walk as fools when we reject the word of God, when we lean on our own understanding, when we live based on our own opinion, when we think our will is best, we are living, it says here, like a fool. Instead, what does God tell us to be? He says, we want, I want you to be wise. He says here, I don't want you to be unwise. Well, how do we not be unwise? He wants us to understand. He wants us to understand. What is it he wants us to understand? He says it right here. Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand what the will of the Lord is. He has a will for us, and he wants to us to know it. He's saying here, don't remain unwise. Don't remain clueless to my plan. So he has a will. He wants you to know his will. And third, God's will is revealed in his word. God's word, God's will is revealed in his word. Again, we're still on John 7, 17. If anybody wants to do his will, he shall know it concerning the doctrine, concerning the doctrine. God's will is first and foremost revealed in his word. Keep in mind that God's will will never contradict his word. The spirit of God will never lead you contrary to the word of God that he inspired. It's like what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119. It says here, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have a treasure in the completed, inspired, inerrant, infallible, written word of God. We don't need self-help books to tell us we can have it all or to think positive or to find joy. We have the word of God and put it in secular terms for a blueprint for success. So God has a will. He wants you to know his will and his will is revealed in his word. And fourthly, the fourth part of part B on your handout, you must desire to do God's will in order to know God's plan explicitly. You must desire to do God's will in order to know God's plan explicitly. So the verse starts again on verse John, John 7, 17. If anybody wants to do his will, and we've seen many times over the pulpit this here, this if is third class condition means if you might or you might not. Many believers are not interested in doing God's will. The anyone here, right there, indicates that all of us, all of us are included in God's plans. God has a plan for each one of us, 
And the word wants here, wants is desires. Wants is desires. And it's in the present tense, which means we're to keep on desiring, continually do it. It's in the active voice, which means it's something we need to choose. If we desire to do God's will, this verse says, we shall know. He will begin to show us his will through his word. And to see this a little bit further, let's go on to Romans 12. And I, and I think Philip used this in his lesson the other day as well. Let's go to Romans 12. This is where Paul is beseeching or urging believers here. Romans 12, in verses 1 and 2, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if we look here, it says that you present, which carries the idea of yield. God is not asking us to perform. God is not asking us to produce. What he's really saying here is be transformed. He's really asking us to change the way we're thinking and choose God's way. And what is God's way? It says it here at the end. God has a good, he has an acceptable, and he has a perfect will. A perfect will. It cannot be improved upon. We each need to decide if we'll yield on him and depend on him to provide our needs. And Pastor Roxer says this many times. This is not a one-time dedication, but it has to start at some point. George Mueller is, Mueller is a good example to all of us about seeking the will of God. He has one of my favorite quotes. He says, nothing common to man is foreign to me. He strikes me as a very humble man. And he says this, in answers to prayers from George Mueller narratives, he stated the following regarding how to ascertain the will of God. He has six parts to this. I'm only going to go in detail on the first one. He says, number one, I seek at the beginning to get my heart in such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Nine-tenths of the trouble, and Pastor Rockner, when he taught this, said 99 one-hundredths of the trouble. Nine-tenths of the trouble with people generally is here. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts, when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will. Whatever it may be, when one is truly in the state, it's usually but a little way to the knowledge of what his will is. And using me as an example, I mentioned this when I went on, a, on my first trip to the Gambia. I prayed for years, Lord, make me usable, but often it's with uh, according to my will. If you ask me to do something out of my comfort zone, I want to head the other direction, right? Ask me to be a deacon. Ask me to teach Romans. Ask me to go to Gambia twice with Randy the second time. Ask me to teach over the pulpit. What's my first reaction? But then you've got to look at have no will of your own. It's not easy to do. Then George Mueller goes on. He says, you don't leave it to feelings or impressions. He says, I seek the will of the Spirit of God through or in connection with the Word of God. The Spirit and the Word must be combined. And then he says, providential circumstances definitely have a play. And then he goes in prayer to the Lord. And finally, he says, through prayer the study of the word, and reflection, I come to deliberate judgment. And he says he has found this very effective. I think it's a good model for us to use. So we have our promise, we have our premise, and third on your handout, at the bottom of page one, we have a basic principle, and that's to know God's will. To know God's will, I always start with the known will of God. To know God's will, I always start with the known will of God. So our formula, again, is God plus you daily depending on him and seeking to do the will of God. And in that 2013 message that Pastor Roxer taught, and he's done this in other studies, he reflected the known will of God by eight S's. That's why I'm doing it eight S to the eighth power. He says to know God's will, always start with the known will of God. Start where you know to be true in the scriptures. Respond to that and watch the Lord begin to reveal the unknown will in our lives. So, 
Part B on your handout, regarding the known will of God, the Bible makes it clear that it's God's will that you be first and foremost saved. That you be saved. And to see this, we're going to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And starting in verse 4, it says this, Who, referring to God, desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So if we circle the word all here, it shows us that God desires that all men be saved from hell, to be delivered from the penalty of sin. But look at this. It says here, he desires. He's not going to force us. He desires that, but he's not going to force us. And we've seen this before. This word saved is in the aorist tense, which means it's at a point in time. It's a completed action. It's also in the passive voice. It's in the passive voice, which means God's the one who does the saving. We don't save ourselves. What do we do in the, in the, sent, in the verse here? We come to the knowledge of the truth. Through faith in Christ alone, we are saved. God gave himself a ransom for all of us, which means this, that all are savable. But each person needs to individually choose to believe or trust in Jesus Christ himself. So if you're new here tonight and you're not sure if you're saved, I'd ask you to consider these four questions. If you are here, which most of you are saved, I would ask you just to pray for those who might be new. And the first question to be thinking about, is heaven an earned reward or is it a free gift? What percentage chance of you do you have of going to heaven tonight? Why would God let you into heaven? What can you do to lose heaven? Now, we've often seen John 3.16 used to illustrate God's plan for salvation, and it addresses those four questions. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the context of the gospel starts with God, and we've seen it drawn here many times using the John 3.16 diagram. We have God up in the kingdom of God. We have us down in the world. And God, according to the Bible, is holy. Psalm 99.9 said, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Which means he's perfect, he's pure. He's also righteous, which means he sets standards. He's also just, which means he judges those standards. And God gave Israel the Ten Commandments to express his holiness. And for the rest of us, it shows us how we fall short of his standards as well. So here's all the things he tells us not to do. He tells us not to lie, not to steal, not disobey parents, not to covet, no idols, no murder, no adultery, not use the Lord's name in vain. And if you do any of those, you're a liar, you're a thief, you're a rebel, you're envious, you're an idolater, you're hateful, you're a fornicator, you're a blasphemer. So if we did our, ma continuing with our math theme, if you just did 10 of those sins a day, that means in a year you're doing 3,650. In 10 years you're doing 36,500. 20 years, 73,000. 40 years, 146,000. And in 80 years, you would do over a quarter million sins. How many of us think somebody who did a quarter million sins deserves to go to heaven? How many sins did it take to kick Adam and Eve out of the garden? It took one. So we know that we're all way over the limit. And the Bible says that we are all sinners and we are all guilty. Romans 3.23 said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we have this sin barrier between sinful man and a holy God. And what the Bible says is we deserve death we deserve to be separated from God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're on this left side of the barrier. And we'd like to get on to the right side of the barrier. So then John 3.16 goes on to the content of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
So thankfully, God is also a God of love. And he gave Jesus Christ to die on the cross. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again. Christ died, it shows it here in the diagram, he died the death that we deserve. He paid our sin penalty in full. God's justice was satisfied when he poured his wrath on Jesus Christ on the cross. So moving on then, well, what, how are we supposed to respond to that? John 3.16 said, whoever believes in him. So what the Bible is saying, put your faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. That means to trust or rely on, and faith is how you receive what God has given us. When you put your faith in Christ, the moment you believe, God crosses out all of those sins up there. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. So it's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. So then we go to John 3, 16, and we see the result. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. The moment you believe, you will not perish, but you'll have eternal life. Since you're no longer condemned to hell, we can cross that out as well. And then we have this line here that takes us from this left side through the cross up to God in heaven. He's provided life for us through the life of another, and we come through that barrier at a point in time when we believe. And 1 John 5.13 said, These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have what? Ever lasting life. So I'll go back to those four questions. Is heaven an earned reward or a free gift? The Bible is very clear. It's a free gift. What percentage chance do you have of going? It's either zero or a hundred. There's nothing in between. You can be a hundred percent sure because you place your trust in Jesus Christ and there's nothing you can do to lose it. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation Nothing you can keep it. You don't need to say a sinner's prayer. You don't need to come up to the altar. You don't need to get baptized. You simply just need to trust in Jesus Christ. So to repeat, the first S in the will of God is that you be saved. And until you understand that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, the next seven S's don't apply to you. But if it does apply to you, after being saved, uh, the second on your list here then, if you put your trust in Christ, is God wants you to be spirit-filled. He wants you to be spirit-filled. And to see this, let's go back again to Ephesians 5. Back to Ephesians 5. And we're going to look at verse 17 again. It says, therefore, do not be unwise, we saw that, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he says, and... And do not be drunk with wine, which is in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The word and here in verse 18 is connecting understanding or knowing the will of God knowing the will of God, with be filled with the Spirit. So it's connecting, understanding, being filled with the Spirit. We don't have to pray about it. We don't have to wonder about it. God wants us to be filled with the Spirit. So is that what this is? Absolutely not. It's not a mystical experience. It's not involving tongues, Holy Spirit glue, or some other kind of sensational emotion. The question we should ask then is, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? To be, to be filled with the Spirit assumes that you have the Holy Spirit to fill you. So go back a couple pages to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, and we're going to see what the Lord has to say about this. Ephesians 1, in verse 13. Ephesians 1, 13 says this, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, 
you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So step number one here is you heard the gospel. Number two, number two is you believe the gospel. You placed your trust in Christ. Then what happens? Number three, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's a finished transaction, and believers belong to the Lord. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. But again, this isn't some kind of mystical feeling. You know so because the Word of God right here says you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's objective is to produce holy life that glorifies Christ. If you want a more detailed explanation, you might flip to the back of your sheet, back to the top, and just note that message two of that 2013 series. Pastor Roxer goes through this in great detail. Or you can go back to last Wednesday's message from Bob, and Bob covered the right column here as well. But for now, let's go back to Ephesians 5. Go back to Ephesians 5, and let's look at verse 18. And let's look at what God does not want believers to be. What God does not want believers to be, he says, and do not be drunk with wine, which in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So the word filled here means to be full completely. To be full completely. The Spirit seeks to dominate the believer by using the Word of God to point them to Jesus Christ. This is in the present tense, which means this is something we're to continue doing, something we're going to do over and over in our lives. This is the normal Christian life. Filled is also in the imperative mood. And we know that when we see imperative mood, it's a command. It's a command. It's absolutely necessary to live the Christian life God's way. We can't just crank it out in our own strength just by trying harder. Now, Pastor Roxer, if you go to his lessons here, those 11 lessons, he covers this in great detail about the, our relationship with the sin nature, but for the sake of time, we're going to fast forward to Romans 6. So if you would go to Romans 6, we're going to go to Romans 6 and look at verse 13. And we're going to see the same word that we saw in Romans 12. It says, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So again, this means presenting or yielding. It doesn't mean producing. It doesn't mean performing. You are saying, Lord, I am dead to the sin nature. I'm alive to you in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is my life. Thank you that I do not have to serve the sin nature any longer. I now present myself to you. And again, this is not a one-time dedication, but it's a willingness. It's a willingness to present or yield to him. I'm here for you to fill me with your spirit, to direct my life, to do your will. Now I'll test the pen color change here. The key point here is that this is not about our willpower. We cannot succeed in our Christian life on our own strength and our own wisdom. We have this new nature here. We have a new nature that gives us the desire to do what's right, but it's not the power source to do it. If our sin nature right here, which we still have, takes on our new nature, the sin nature wins every time, and we're right in Romans 7. The power source for us is right here in the Holy Spirit. If that power is tapped into and you yield to the Lord and depend on the Lord, you can live your life through the Spirit. Romans 8, 6 says this, to be spiritually minded is life. It is peace. I have great purpose to live. I have great peace because I'm not trying to produce. I'm not trying to perform but I want to do the will of God. I'm yielding to the Lord. I'm wrecking myself to be dead to the sin nature, alive to God in Christ, and I'm yielding myself to the Lord. Now I want to depend on him and walk in fellowship with him. We want to allow the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, to take the word of God 
and direct us and the Spirit of God to enable us to live his life for him because we can't do it ourselves. This is the UD of that formula. We have to depend on him. We can't live the Christian life through our own. It's too high a standard. But the Lord can do it through us by means of the Spirit. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. So regarding the known will of God, the Bible makes it clear that it's his will that we be saved, that we be spirit-filled, and thirdly on your handout, that we be spiritually growing, that we be spiritually growing. And to see this, let's turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. We're actually going to start back in verse 17. It says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. Amen. So, but grow here is in the present tense, which means we're to keep on growing. Peter says this because it's possible to not keep growing. It's the active voice, which means this is something we must choose to do. We can't produce it, but we can choose it. We can choose to respond to the Lord and allow this to occur. It's also, as we've seen in the other words we've used here, it's in an imperative mood, which means it's a command. The command shows us that it's the will of God's will that we grow. So God's will is the top chart. We've seen this before. Once we are born again, he wants to produce growth in our lives. And over time, taking the word of God, responding by faith to the trials in our life, he wants us to grow as believers. He doesn't want us to be in this bottom chart, just growing old. He wants us to be this top chart. He wants us to grow up. Let's go back. Let's turn now to 1 Peter 1 and see what must precede it, though. What must precede spiritual growth? Before we can grow, we must be born spiritually. And we see this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. Having been born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever, and in verse 25, it says, But the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Spiritual growth is not a topic for unbelievers. They cannot grow until they've been saved. They need to be saved and wired for sound so that the Spirit of God can enable them to take the truths of the word of God and see them implemented in their lives. Let's continue in the book of Peter by looking at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And he says this on the heels of being born again in verse 1 and 2. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. So desire here means to intensely desire intensely desire as newborn babes. We are to intensely desire the pure milk of the word like newborn babes. It's the will of God that we crave his word. We're not going to grow unless we choose to intensely desire. And desire is in the active voice, which again means it's something we must choose to do. We must choose to make this a priority if we're going to grow. This is where we can fall down when the word of God is not a priority for us. And the you in the second verse here is plural, which means all believers. He's addressing all believers. And he's saying here, pure, pure milk, which means there are impure options. And we saw them starting out the message tonight. There's a lot of impure options in the world. If we are going to grow, we need to intensely desire the pure milk of the word. And the word here is, is logicon. It means the spiritual, logical word of God. The word of God is extremely logical, and the objective is that we grow thereby by means of the word. 
And we've seen this chart many times, and I gave you a little bit of space on your handout to write a few things here. In order to grow, we need time. We need truth. So God's provided teachers, the Spirit of God and human teachers. He's going to, we got teachers, he's going to allow trials in our life, and he's going to take that truth and apply it where it's needed. And then we must walk by faith in order for this to occur. Mature believers have had to look to the Lord in trials. They've had to grow through trials. They learn to trust and rely on the Lord. Believers do not mature overnight. It takes time to grow. And an important principle to close out this third S is this. God wants you to be controlled by the Spirit. It is his will for you. If you are unwilling to respond to his known will, don't expect his leading in the unknown details of his plan because you are not a directable, leadable person when you are walking after the flesh. And Pastor Roxer repeated that quote a number of times in that 2013 series. So we know that it's God's will that we be saved, that we be spirit-filled, that we be spiritually growing, and our final S that we're going to cover in some detail tonight is number four, that we be sexually pure. That we be sexually pure. And it will be purely PG tonight as well. So sexually pure. And to see this, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm just going to start in verse 3 here. It says it right off the start. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this, they're saying, it's not Paul saying here, this is not me talking, he who rejects this does not reject man, but rejects God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So if you look at this, verse 3 makes it really clear, it's the will of God that we what? That we abstain from sexual immorality. It's God's will that we be sanctified, which means that we be set apart, that we be sanctified or set apart in our daily walk with Christ by way of sexual purity. God desires that our thoughts, our words, and our actions would be pleasing to him and set apart to him. And back to verse 1, it's brethren he's referring to. Paul is addressing believers here. The will of God for an unbeliever is that they need to be saved. But as a result of being saved and being placed in Christ, believers are to be filled with the Spirit, growing and set apart to God. And Paul urges, urges believers here to do this based on what? Based on their position and relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've seen this before. How are we to walk as believers? Hebrews 11:6 6 says we are to walk by faith. As we walk by faith, we please the Lord. We live the Christian life the same way we were saved. At salvation, we admitted we cannot save ourselves. Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again to save me. I trust in him alone. In the Christian life, we have to admit we cannot do it on our own. Instead, we need to rely on the Lord, depend on him, and then we have it in our formula, God plus us depending on him. So what is the divinely designed parameters for sexual fulfillment? As Pastor Roxer said in this series, God is not a cosmic killjoy or out of step with the times of our culture. God is the one who created sex for procreation and pleasure. Hebrews 13.4 says this, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. The verse makes it very clear that marriage is the only context for sex. Now, I'm going to keep this PG, but I'm asked the question, what does having sex mean? 
Well, let's look at what our former president says. <laughs> right? He says it depends on what your definition of is is. Right? And again, I would ask, are we going to look for the world to answer that question? I sure hope not. It's stunning just to hear somebody in that role say that. Now, our family has been helped by the 2003 series that Pastor Kurt taught on dating, and it does not mean that we always have followed it. But he said this about it. He says, it's an alternative model leading to marriage, starting with pursuing a friendship in light of mutual interest and attraction. Emotions and feelings are not more reliable than assessing someone's character. The timing for dating or courting is when you are personally prepared to be married. It is not an age issue, it's a maturity issue. Economics, emotional needs, and maturity all play a role. Now Kurt, in I think it's his message nine on that dating, he summarized principal dating or courting with five fingers. Finger number one, he said there's a purpose. You're seeing if it's the Lord's will to be married. Number two, there's a reasonable time frame. Number three, and this isn't always the case, it's not always possible, but there's parental involvement. And I'm skipping to number five, he said there's no gruesome twosome. Number four was no physical intimacy. No physical intimacy. Now, Pastor Roxer stated this as well. Sexual desire is normal, but we are instructed to be set apart from the world's view of sex and fulfill the desire within the will of God. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says this. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now good comes from the Greek word kalon. I might pronounce that wrong, but it's advantageous. It's beneficial. It's fitting. It's proper. It is good. And the touch comes from the Greek word that means to start a fire, to hold on, to touch. It means sexual relations. It means sexual relations. Now, I'm not here trying to define where the touching limit starts and ends, but I would encourage all of us as believers to save physical intimacy for that one special purpose, one special person in the context of marriage and not look to the world for the definition of is. The Lord will be honored and you will be blessed. So in the context of dating, the path to sexual purity can be summarized by two principles. Don't defraud your brother and take what's not your own. And it's good not to touch, in this case, have sexual relations with the woman. For more details, Pastor Rocks or his lesson three addresses this. But I would just encourage us as believers to follow the will of God as defined in the word of God and reject the ever-declining worldly morals. So we're supposed to be saved, spirit-filled, spiritually growing, sexually pure, and now we're just going to fill out the last four before we conclude tonight. And you can look these up on your own. Number five is be submissive. Be submissive. And you can look up that verse reference. Number six is suffering for Christ's sake. Suffering for Christ's sake. Number seven is saying thanks. Saying thanks. And the eighth S, or S to the eighth power, is serving the Savior in all that you do. Serving the Savior in all that you do. Submissive, suffering, saying thanks, and serving. So to conclude this message, here again is the little formula. It's God, one, plus you daily depending on him and seeking and doing the known will of God. Dr. Dennis Roxer added this in one of his studies. Anything an unbeliever can do is not, and this is on your handout, it's a closing principle, Anything an unbeliever can do is not the Christian way of life. For if you do not need the Holy Spirit, and an unbeliever does not have the Holy Spirit, then obviously there is nothing supernatural about your Christian life. So it's a great ending principle and a great beginning principle that we started with as well. So how does this all apply to you? 
Oh, remember our opening principle. To know the will of God, to know God's will, always start with the known will of God. So if you are still without Christ as your Savior, the most important decision you need to make is who will be your Savior. So if you look at the formula, it's just got the one in it. But it's the most important one. God, first and foremost, wants to change your destiny from hell to heaven. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to make you a new creation in Christ. Please don't wait any longer to make your decision. For believers, you can simplify this formula even further. I'm going to simplify it to one plus us. And what I mean by that is this. Human beings are the crowning achievement of God's creation. We were created in the image and likeness of God. We are created to stand in relationship with God, to talk to him, to know him, to enjoy him, to relate and correspond with him. And as our, and as our lesson started, he wants to direct our paths. So as a believer in Christ, we've already made the most important decision, who's going to be our savior? But what about these decisions? Who's going to be your master? Who are you going to serve? What's going to be your mission? How are you going to spend your life? And if you're gifted for it, not everybody is, who will be your spouse? These are important. So for questions like these and others, like where should I live? Where should I work? Should I buy a business? Should I start a business? Should I sell a business? These questions I would encourage you to watch message seven and on in that 2013, the known and will of God. But as I was wrapping up my message, I also thought, well, how does this apply to millennials? Because we have a lot of millennials here. And there's some topics that are trending on Twitter I thought I would relate to you and summarize this message in four topics. So these are trending. If you're following Twitter, let's get on there. Number one is hashtag desire the pure milk of the word. Hashtag desire the pure milk of the word. Number two is hashtag read your Bible. And third, hashtag don't be dull. Now, all kidding aside, this message applies to you as a millennial as well. God wants to direct your path right now, and the question is, are you going to let him? Let's pray.